invasive species is a species that's not native to the United States, that's been introduced and causes harm, either economic, environmental, or harm to human health. Important to remember that not all non-native species become invasive, only about one in 1,000 of the plants introduced to this country pose problems in natural areas. Can you make an invasive species safe by reducing its seed set? And we found that in long-lived species, perennials and woody plants, the cultivars have to be completely sterile in order to be safe. So what do these species look like when they invade natural areas? Some are very widespread and have been invading for decades, and others are newer invaders that we're concerned about and want to control before they become too widespread. This is an example that we're gonna show you how buckthorn, common buckthorn, uh, can impact these natural areas. Um, common buckthorn has been released and been available for well over 50 years in the Midwestern United States and really, I think is no one will object, can have an impact to these natural areas. Where we're at right now is the University of Wisconsin Arboretum where they manage buckthorn and we're kind of on the edge of where they manage and do not manage buckthorn infestations in a hardwood forest. As you'll see over here, uh, this is just on the leading edge, just locally right here, we see a wide range of saplings of maples actively growing, some healthy litter that those saplings require to actually establish, and in other areas we do see a wide range of, of diversity of other plant species. So in contrast, I'm gonna walk into the area where it's invaded and you'll see some dramatic changes. First off, you see many young uh, and middle-aged uh, buckthorn seedlings that we have right here. If we look down very closely, what we'll see is several small one to two to three-year-old buckthorn plants that are just germinating and growing, several plants that are likely three to five, maybe seven years old. And then if you look in the background, you see large buckthorn trees that are over 20 years, probably 30 to 40 years old too. The other issue that you will see here is you see very few to no maple saplings uh, in this system where buckthorn is invaded due to competition and other issues. Looking down to the soil surface, we see much less litter present in this system compared to 20 feet away where we manage that buckthorn. So this is an example of how we, uh, what we'll see from coming from the leading edge, which I am right here, and coming into a more diverse setting where you have much less buckthorn. Now I'm walking up, there's no buckthorn. We see saplings of maple trees growing actively here. As we move a little bit further, we'll see lots of diversity. This is a, a clear example of some of the impacts that buckthorn can have. So what you're looking at now is McDonald Woods in Chicago Botanic Garden. This area has been restored. It's where buckthorn has been removed and it is actively managed for a number of invasive species. Costs for removal and restoration are often prohibitive, especially in the Northeast Illinois region. Contract costs range from three to five thousand dollars. Our concern is that Japanese barberry and burning bush will become like common buckthorn and it will invade heavily invade a lot of natural areas in this region and throughout the Midwest. So our hope is that by sounding the alarm now via outreach and education, we will be able to have a chance to take advantage of the small window of opportunity for early detection and rapid response. Next to me is Euonymus elatus, also known as burning bush and winged Euonymus. 
Euonymus elatus was brought to the United States around 1860 from Northeast Asia for ornamental purposes. Since then, it has been planted widely for its bright colored berries and its fall colorful foliage. Unfortunately, winged Euonymus has spread beyond its intended planting area and has become invasive and in fact is prohibited from sale in two states. In Illinois, where I work, I often find Euonymus as small statured shrubs scattered throughout the woodlands and forests. Here at Barker Woods Natural Area in northern Indiana, winged Euonymus has spread throughout this small forest parcel. Winged Euonymus spreads locally, vegetatively, and also from seed. Next to these adult shrubs, small seedlings can be found on the ground where the seed falls. Winged Euonymus also spreads via bird dispersal from long distances and from planting for landscape features. When Euonymus becomes abundant, it reduces the light that reaches the ground layer. This reduces the abundance of our native grasses, forbs, and sedges, reducing the ground layer habitat for forest interior nesting birds, and also the forage for a, a variety of wildlife. I'm here at a site that is being invaded by barberry. This is a common ornamental plant that we do see that is spreading into natural areas and this is an example of that. Barberry was first planted and brought into the United States in the late 1800s. Uh, it's probably common to the Midwest and brought into the Midwest around 1950. We're here in the Wisconsin Dells. Uh, in Wisconsin and this is an example of it spreading into a natural area. We're in a forested area that's abutting a natural area that's a state park in Wisconsin. Uh, what's interesting about barberry is like many other ornamentals is this plant actually initially is introduced and has what's known as a lag period or a period where it doesn't spread into unintended areas. For the case of barberry here this is about 10 to 20 years it was well behaved and did not move into natural areas. Then all of a sudden it starts spreading and now as you can see here is fairly widely spread in many of our natural areas and is becoming much of a problem. This plant is spread as you can see here by berries. It produces these red berries which are then eaten by animals, particularly birds, and can be transported long distances over several miles. And this is one of the leading reasons why, why this plant is spreading so actively. What damage does it do to the environment that it spreads into, and particularly in these understories in the forests in the Midwestern United States? It can be several fold. Clearly it's competing with native vegetation and suppressing native vegetation. Also what's happening here is changing the soil characteristics and the microbes that are present in the soil. It's also promoting earthworms to become a problem, with, which is a big problem in our hardwood forest and regeneration. So clearly barberry is a problem here and it's becoming more and more a problem over time even though it's been here since the 50s really now it, we see, are seeing it actively spreading on the landscape and are really concerned about this ornamental plant that has gone bad. Calorie pear is a species that came from China. It was brought into the United States because it was a fast-growing, disease-resistant, air pollution-tolerant plant with beautiful flowers. It was also sterile to start with. However, horticulturists developed new cultivars of calorie pear that had better branch structure, that had pretty uh, fall foliage and, and other desirable characteristics. Now, when those different cultivars got planted near to each other, they were able to cross because they were genetically different and it meant that they were able to produce fruits. And what we're seeing is that that is leading to lots and lots of fruit production. And the fruits are then eaten by birds, primarily starlings, who move the fruits and the seeds all over and new small calorie pears start to grow. Calorie pear, when it moves into areas, can grow very densely. And as a consequence of that, it can displace the tree seedlings that are regenerating the forest. So we can see an interruption of forest succession. We are seeing it grow very densely in old fields in the lower Midwest and basically stopping the succession of those old fields into forest. 
Hi, my name is Trent Osman. I'm a forester here in southern Indiana, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what um, will be affected by the uh, invasive calorie pear. First off, our understory at this, at this place is more of a, a lot of sugar maple. This is a sugar maple that we're standing here under. And the understory is, is a native understory of some woodland grasses and sedges. Um, right here is a native oak that's getting ready to leaf out in the understory. Um, we have some Dutchman's breeches, which is a popular spring ephemeral wildflower. Here's a small sugar maple that's leafing out. Um, some cut leaf toothwort that's already flowered down here, a very common woodland wildflower. Uh, we're all underneath this smaller tree here that looks to be an ironwood or uh, some people know it as a muscle wood. Carpinus caroliniana is the species. And right in the midst of it, we see our friend the calorie pear. And uh, this is this, it's getting its foothold here. Um, I see a couple others here behind me. This over here is another one that has gotten its foothold. And then again, we have all that same native um, understory under here that's, that's going to be affected eventually by this. At the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, our mission is to reduce the impacts of invasive plants in the Midwest. However, we know that the issue of invasive plants in horticulture is really a complicated one. Businesses have invested a lot of time and a lot of money in developing these species for cultivation, and people get used to particular plants that they know and love, and they want to keep planting them. So what we're trying to do is to work proactively with the green industry by encouraging them to voluntarily reduce the amount of invasive plants that they're selling and to offer new, safer alternatives for people to buy. We've created a couple of tools to help consumers learn about what choices they should be making and plants they should avoid. We have a brochure called Landscape Alternatives for Invasive Plants of the Midwest. And that brochure lists some of the species that are currently in trade in the Midwest that are invasive in our natural areas. And for each invasive plant, there are alternatives listed both native plants, which are obviously safe for natural areas, and some non-native species that we know have never invaded a natural area. We also have created a smartphone app that will allow you to take your phone to a nursery or a garden center and type in the name of a plant to find out whether or not it's invasive. If it is invasive, we'll provide you with some better alternatives that you could plant instead. We really hope that people will use the brochure and the app to make choices that are better for natural areas, better for native wildlife and native ecosystems. <laughs>